Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kel Rossiella. I direct the UCLA Berkeley Center for International Relations, and it's my great pleasure on behalf of our partners, which include the Luskin School here at UCLA, the UCLA Latin American Institute, uh, the Wilson Center's uh, Latin American Program in DC, the Carter Center, and the Community of Democracies. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our conference on safeguarding democracy in the Americas, how to strengthen the inter-American inter democratic charter 20 years after its adoption. I think as you all know, we organized this conference around the Summit of the Americas, which is kicked off this week and will be continuing for the next couple of days. It's a great pleasure to have so many fantastic people from around the region, uh, also from this campus, but really from all over coming to talk about this. And as you know, President Boric of Chile, uh, Chile will give our uh, keynote later this morning. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Ambassador Mark Green, the CEO and president of the Wilson Center for some preliminary remarks, and then we're gonna dive right in. Ambassador Green. Uh, thank you. And uh, these will be just preliminary overview remarks so you can get to the meat of your, uh, of your program. As a reminder, a bit of context, it was 40 years ago today, this very day, that Ronald Reagan gave his famous Westminster speech. He was the first president ever to speak before the British Parliament, but it was that speech that launched the US approach to democracy assistance all around the world. And 40 years ago today, Ronald Reagan told us all, democracy is not a fragile flower. Still, it needs cultivating. As he said, if the rest of this century is to witness the gradual growth of freedom and democratic ideals, we must take actions to assist the campaign for democracy. And that's what got that process going. It was 20 years ago, roughly, that the Inter-American Democratic Charter was adopted. And that charter says in its very first article, the peoples of the Americas have a right to democracy and their governments have an obligation to promote and defend. So where are we today? Well, that's what this session is really all about. And so I want to offer my sincere thanks to our hosts here today, UCLA, including the Burkle Center for International Relations, the Luskin School of Public Affairs, and the Latin American Institute. I also want to thank our partners, the Carter Center and the Community of Democracies, including its Secretary General and my longtime friend, Tom Garrett, and of course, I wanna thank the many civil society leaders who are here today and those that they represent. Cultivating and reinforcing democracy is one of the most important challenges our hemisphere faces. In the early 1990s, nearly all of the countries in the Western hemisphere were democratic, with Argentina, Brazil, and Chile having successfully transitioned from long periods of military rule. And while there has been continued progress in some parts of the Americas, there have also been challenges and setbacks. In fact, the most recent annual report from our friends at Freedom House suggests that few regions in the world have a greater spread between free and not free countries than ours, than the Americas. The dark spots are clear. The authoritarian regimes in Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela continue to deny their people fair elections as well as basic human rights. Havana continues to harass, beat up and jail those who stray from the official party line. In Nicaragua, Ortega has dissolved and canceled hundreds of NGOs and unjustly he is holding well over 170 political prisoners. In Port-au-Prince, a president has been assassinated and lawlessness has taken hold in too many neighborhoods. And in Venezuela, a country blessed in resources, the economy has been reduced to stockouts and scarcities in the most basic of food and medicine due to Maduro's mismanagement, corruption, and repression. In troubled parts of the Americas, thousands in Venezuela, millions are voting with their feet. So where do we see hope? Where are there reasons for optimism? first and foremost in the people of the Americas themselves, and the CSOs, the civil society organizations that give them voice, the church and st the state students and church leaders who, despite all the threats and brutality, stand up for democracy in Nicaragua, the ladies in white who still march quietly 
for their family members imprisoned in Cuba. The countless democracy activists in Venezuela who chose not Maduro but Guaido and refused to back down no matter how much pain Maduro tries to inflict. Since President Reagan spoke at Westminster 40 years ago today, the challenge to democracy's growth has evolved. 40 years ago, there was still an ideological debate whether democracy was actually the right answer for most of the world. The debate is over and the Inter-American Democratic Charter is very clear proof. But a new battlefront has emerged in its place and it is the one that we must talk about now. It involves a new crop of politicians who brazenly claim democracy's mantle only to rob the term of any real meaning. They say they want elections. In fact, they welcome elections. And then they bend the rules, prohibit true debate, and rig the results so the game is over before it has even begun. In many ways, this new front in the campaign for democracy is more dangerous for us. It is certainly more complex. The opponents of democracy know full well that civil society is the irreplaceable connective tissue between everyday citizens and democratic institutions. It's what helps government become truly citizen-centered and citizen responsive. It's what strengthens the accountability any real democracy must have. And so it's also what autocrats target for intimidation and repression. So 40 years on from Westminster, 20 years on from that democratic charter, if democracy is to return to its hopeful path once again, it is crucial to protect and to reaffirm the role of civil society throughout the Americas. And the challenge is serious and the work will always be hard, but it's what we owe democracy's frontline heroes. Those students in Nicaragua, the artists in Havana, and so many others. And that's what today's session is about and what we should all take home when we leave here today. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to this discussion. There is important work to be done. And so now to get things going, I would like to turn this conversation over to Dr. Benjamin Gadan, who is acting director of the Wilson Center's Latin America program. Benjamin, over to you for the discussion. Many thanks to everyone for being here today, both in person and online. Thank you to all of our partners at UCLA. Thank you to the Carter Center, to the Community of Democracies. Um, and thank you very much to our expert panelists who we'll be hearing from shortly. As Ambassador Green described well, there's no greater, more pressing topic for the Americas. And there are plenty of, of competing urgent matters. The Summit of the Americas is addressing uh, addressing a variety of themes from the digitalization of the region, economic recovery, uh, strengthening public health systems, addressing the impacts of, of climate change on the region, food insecurity, violence, you name it. It's hard to imagine durable solutions to any of those challenges without better governance. And it's hard to imagine a path to better governance without stronger democratic institutions. And as we've just heard, and we will discuss in greater detail, democratic institutions in the region have been suffering for many years now, um, and we've seen an accelerating deterioration in the quality of democracy in many parts of this region, a region that had until recently been seen as a model for democratic transitions. We're gonna start our conversation with an overview of the state of democracy globally, and in particular in Latin America, from my colleague from UCLA, Dr. Helmut Anheyer, after which we will go into greater detail with our speakers, including the Secretary General of the Community of Democracies, Tom Garrett, the Secretary General of International IDEA, Kevin Casa Zamora, the leader from Justicia Transicional Mexico, Mari Caro Costa, and briefly will be joined by Laura Chinchilla, the former president of Costa Rica, who's, who's joining us as I speak. Um, after we have a conversation amongst ourselves, I will very quickly invite all of you to participate, both students and faculty and other experts who have gathered here at UCLA to discuss again, what I believe to be the most pressing matter in the Western hemisphere. With that, I'll move, I welcome you to the podium. Sorry. Welcome. 
Uh, yes, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think I uh, wanted to add what the ambassador has just uh, referred to, um, uh, that we have various landmarks this year, right? He referred to uh, so many years of that chart and so many years of that chart. There's also one charter that we very often forget, but it has perhaps been the most important charters of all, and that is the Atlantic Charter, which was signed by FDR and, and Churchill uh, on the Atlantic um, in, uh, in 1941. And that laid the uh, architecture for the post-World War II to world. And uh, all too often, we forget the Atlantic Charter, and it's worth reading it, because it makes very important claims as to the importance of democracy as well. Uh, what I will present to you in the next uh, 15 minutes is very much a context to our discussion. It um, has to do with an index we developed here at uh, uh, the Luskin School uh, with the support of the Berggruen Institute at uh, UCLA. And it, um, I'm, I'm just trying to operate this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, it, it, it asks a very important question, we think. Uh, how is it that uh, governments and countries differ so much in the quality of life they, they provide, keeping everything else uh, equal? Uh, we understand governments as the ability of a country to manage public problems and to deliver public goods, such as healthcare, a safe environment, and social uh, security. And I want you to show that government's governance really matters. And here is the life expectancy of two countries, Denmark and the United States, and you see how they diverge, right? And it has to do with different decisions that governments have made about how much they invest in public health. And public health, of course, is a public good, right? And it is a dramatic difference, and it's almost three to four years uh, of life expectancy that emerge, that emerge as a difference just in the last uh, two decades. Right? Um, so we wanted to understand um, how accountable are governments and how, uh, and how is their capacity or what is their capacity to act on the mandate they have to deliver public goods and ultimately a quality of life. We introduce a, a triangle, you might say, we call it a governance triangle that examines the relationship between democratic accountability of a government, the capacity a government has to deliver, and the actual result it achieves in terms of public goods. Um, we went through quite a significant uh, way of identify what would then be the uh, correct indicators. And I'm not gonna bore you with that, but just to tell you that there are many, many, many indicators and we have uh, nine major indicators for each of these dimensions. So we look at institutional accountability, electoral accountability, societal accountability, and asking how democratic is a country? So we go beyond, does it have elections, but are there appropriate checks and balances? Is there a, a vibrant civil society on the ground? When it comes to state capacity, one has to do with fiscal aspects, tax revenue, right? And is government able to coordinate among different partners? Because very often government doesn't do things alone. It usually needs either the public, uh, the, the private or the nonprofit sector to deliver. And then we look at three types of public goods, social public goods, economic public goods, and environmental public goods. And this is what we found. First, looking at the, um, what you can't see on that is, uh, on the left, this is Africa, right? And Africa starts at a low level. Um, by the way, can we somehow get to full screen? Uh, because it does not show it on up here. Good. Yeah. yeah, so um, this is a bit of a disadvantage that you have um, at the moment. This is uh, how democratic accountability developed between the year 2000 and the year 2020. And you see that in Africa, we see uh, a way upward. So Africa is actually more democratically accountable than it was. Uh, this line here, this is, uh, this is like, these are the Americas. So that's North Central 
and South America together. So there is a slight improvement, but not, not much. Right? And then you have other parts of the world that I won't go into now. The, the most democratic part of the world is, is Europe at the moment. But even in Europe, you do see a kind of a flattening of the curve. And this is then the state capacity. And here it gets uh, very, very uh, uh, critical because the average state capacity increased somewhat in, in Africa and it decreased in Latin America, right? And it improved somewhat in Asia and it's about the same in, in Europe. What is critical in our index is the relationship between uh, the accountability. Uh, this is the accountability one. Uh, see, it, uh, it drops in the Americas quite significantly, right? And it's that region of the world that shows the most clear drop in the last 20 years when it comes to accountability. And what we uh, focus at in the index is the relationship between democratic accountability state capacity and public goods delivery for quality of life. And I will say more about that in a moment. Here you see an animation of how countries move about in, these, in the 20 year cycle. Right? And you will see there is not a lot of movement in the upper right hand corner of it. There is a lot of movement down here. Right? And these are the countries that have become uh, more democratic, but then they fall back again. And we say they fall back again because they were unable to translate the mandate of more democratic accountability into state capacity, right? And then the electorate uh, is unhappy or something else happened and the countries fall back into a more autocratic mode, a less democratic mode. So critical is that if a country has an increase in democratic accountability. Critically, critically, you have to increase state capacity and you have to deliver. And many countries fail at doing that. Here you see uh, the United States and China, of course, the two uh, superpowers that we have. And see, China is doing very badly when it comes to democratic accountability, but it manages to improve its state capacity right? Because it has all these resources and it can extract significantly from the population. Whereas the United States has still quite a lot of accountability, but it dropped also significantly in the last 10 years. And it is not moving in the same direction as, as China. Now, uh, here are four Latin American countries. And you see, in Latin America, we have very, very different dynamics going on. In, uh, Venezuela was already mentioned, right? Virtually no accountability, and it is uh, moving very much to the left, losing state capacity uh, significantly, right? So if Venezuela, and that's the, the story that we want to tell, if Venezuela were to become more democratic, what donors and countries wanting to assist Venezuela should keep in mind, it is absolutely urgent then to make sure that there will be state capacity to deliver in the short term, not in 10 years, but you do have to do, make it that within the next election cycle, there will be visible improvements. And, and you see that uh, other countries are oscillating, right? They, uh, they're, not, they're not moving up and down, they're going almost in circles. And here we have to think about what is it that holds these, these countries back? Is it uh, a, a lack of accountability uh, perhaps in countries like, like Brazil, you, you could say that, but it is most likely uh, that state capacity is insufficient for an indicator such as public goods delivery, which is more into the future. So we um, developed this index just in the last year. Uh, we uh, presented it here at UCLA uh, a week ago uh, today, and we... Uh, um, covered 140 countries over a 20 year period. The report is available uh, online. You're most welcome to look at it. There's also a summary, but we were surprised that Africa has improved so much. It's a continent with, that we always associate with uh, misery and uh, things are not moving, going well. 
But um, it is a continent that gives, also gives us hope. And we should think that if you have a region like uh, Latin America that is going through a bit of a malaise when it comes to democratic accountability, uh, other, con other regions of the world started at much worse positions such as, as Africa, and they managed uh, to pull up and to pull out of this. Now, um, keeping in mind, there is a, uh, a, a very important lesson that we um, want to share with you. And uh, in, in summary, I restate it again. Critical is the relationship between democratic accountability once gained, once achieved with a improvement in state capacity in the short to medium term, right? To capture the momentum. And we have too many countries that do not manage to do this and they fall back into a more autocratic mode of governance, right? So, uh, and that's where you can uh, uh, download the report and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Look forward to the discussion. Many thanks, absolutely essential context for our conversation, both, both geographic and thematic. Um, and we very much take on board the notion that it is difficult to separate the quality and, and sustainability and endurance of democracy from the performance of democratic governments um, and their ability to meet the needs of their populations. It's a subject we will address here, but, but perhaps not in the, in the detail it requires, um, but we'll absolutely take, take that on board. Um, that we cannot separate public support for democracy and its ability to endure from the abilities of these governments to meet the demands of their populations. Let me, let me dive right into our conversation about the state of democracy in the Americas. Um, and if in fact we are witnessing democratic backsliding as it appears we are, why is that occurring? Why are the tools that we have developed to prevent that trend not uh, serving the purpose as designed? What structures from this region and other regions might be useful to reconsider what types of better implementation of those tools might be politically feasible. Um, I'll end my final introductory remarks by saying that our goal is solutions here and not simply to identify these challenges, but to come up with as many new ideas as we can that are politically feasible to address these challenges. I wanna start with you, Kevin Casasamora from International Idea, if I might. And my question is, the, the context of the Summit of the Americas, very unfortunately, um, was a debate throughout the region over which country should be participating. And the lessons one might draw from that was one, there are countries that are widely considered authoritarian right now in Latin America, something that's very regrettable and, and other than Cuba wasn't true just a few years ago. But also the fact that so many governments in the region were championing these countries and their participation in the summit was read by some observers as a sign of a frank commitment to democracy in the region, that it no longer should be the ticket to ride in hemispheric institutions. Uh, I'm curious if you read any lessons from those debates um, into this question about the commitment of the region to democracy as an idea. Well, thank you so much. Is this thing on? Thank you so much, uh, Ben, for for inviting me here, first of all, and I would, would like to extend that gratitude to all the organizers of this, this panel. It's wonderful to be here. I mean, who could complain about being in Southern California? Particularly if you come from Stockholm, right? Where <laughs> the weather is different. So uh, look, the question of who comes to the summit, who's invited to the summit is, uh, is of course the topical question of the, of the day. And let me prolong my answer uh, by saying that there's no question that what is happening in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua is abhorrent, it's terrible. It should be denounced in all possible ways. However, on the question of whether those countries should be invited or not to the summit, I'm somewhat of two minds to tell you the truth. It really depends on how you conceive the purpose of the summit. If the summit is to be a celebration of democracy and democratic values, then it makes eminent sense to exclude those countries. And let me be clear that that's the way in which the summit was conceived. Back in 94, it was a different world back then. 
And this is important. Now, if the summit is conceived as a forum to address common challenges, collective challenges in the, in the, in the hemisphere, then it might not make as much sense to exclude those countries. You might need to have as broad an attendance as possible if you want to meet those challenges. It really depends on how you conceive the summit. Now, it's possible to make the argument that one of the collective problems that we are facing is the, the, the weakening of democracy in the region. So that collective purpose is better served by sending the message that they should not be fired. I mean, it really, it really depends on how you think of the purpose of the, of the summit. Now, I'm, I'm less troubled by the, by the people that defend the notion and the countries that defend the notion that Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba should be invited, then, you know, as a transgression to the values and the purpose of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, I think is much more troubling what we've seen over the past couple of years with regards to Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's much more serious. I mean, the fact that there has not been a way to invoke the Inter-American Democratic Charter in the face of grotesque violations of human rights in Nicaragua, I think is much more serious a concern. Um, you know, and there are many reasons why that has happened, you know. And I, I, I hope that in the course of this discussion, we're gonna go into, into some of this, but I mean, we know that the, the enforceability of the Inter-American Democratic Charter has been hamstrung by problems of design of the instrument. As with many other democratic clauses that underpin the workings of other international organizations formally committed to democracy. I mean, look at what has happened within the EU with regards to Hungary and to a lesser degree, Poland. I mean, they're tied up in knots because they don't have the, the means to enforce those, those clauses, which were conceived for threats uh, in a different world. I mean, backsliding was not an issue back then when the Inter-American Democratic Charter was, was drafted. Um, but the enforceability of the Charter has also been hamstrung by problems of political will. I mean, the fact that it hasn't been possible to get to two thirds of the vote at the OAS to to do this tells you something. Now, why, I mean, where are these problems of political will coming from? Well, there are, there are many reasons. I mean, it strikes me as plausible that three reasons, there might be others, are number one, and it pains me to say it, but it's, I guess at this point, self-evident, the loss of US leadership globally when it comes to the moment democracy-related issues. Uh, you know, it's seldom said that one of the reasons for the irresistible expansion, global expansion of democracy over the past 70 years is related to the fact that the preeminent geopolitical power in the world has been a liberal democracy. To the extent that that influence wanes, the whole democratic cause will suffer inevitably. So this is one, and this is playing out in our hemisphere, this loss of leadership. Number two, uh, I think the issue of uh, the exclusion of Cuba continues to poison US Latin America relations in a, in a number of different ways. And countries are in the region are less willing to play along with any mechanism that excludes Cuba because that's a raw nerve in the region. And number three, I, I think there's a, there's a broader issue here, which is that it, many authoritarian leaders and would be authoritarian leaders in the region, as well as globally, sense that there's a change in the international atmosphere to defend democracy. The price that you pay for democratic transgressions is 
far less now than it was a generation ago, diplomatically and otherwise. So I think it's all those factors combined that result in the lack of political will to enforce the clauses that are meant to defend democracy in our regional and hemispheric instruments. Uh, so, you know, the, the, that would be my take on the question of who comes and who, uh, who's excluded from the, from the, from the summit. Excellent, and many thanks. Laura, I'm gonna to turn to you. Kevin has raised a variety of, of issues here that have contributed to the deterioration of democracy in the region. Many of them, you know, not in the region's control and certainly not solvable in the short term. These include democratic recession globally, uh, but also questions of political will that arguably will be difficult to solve. Um, I, I wanna actually focus on the instruments then themselves because there we might be able to productively think about a reform agenda and in particular the, the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Kevin makes the case that it doesn't apply effectively to the new challenges, to democratic backsliding that occurs in a slower manner versus maybe a traditional military coup d'etat where everyone can identify it when they see it and, and react in ways that the charter envisioned. Is that a diagnosis you share? And if so, are there politically feasible ways that this can be implemented to address the modern threats to democracy or if necessary, amended to do so? Uh, yes, uh, I share the, uh, the uh, thoughts that Kevin, um, that Kevin uh, presented um, as a starting point for the discussion. And by the way, thank you also for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here um, discussing uh, probably the most pressing challenge that we have in our region. Uh, but before before moving in the, in the direction of your question, I will. I would like to add uh, three more comments on the summit itself. Uh, I think that also the situation is being aggravated by the inconsistencies that we find in the United States uh, policy towards democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we had the summit of democracy uh, just a couple of three, I don't remember, two months ago or something like that, six months in ago. December. And, 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 and in that occasion, uh, the notion of democracy excluded uh, some other countries that are not coming uh, to the summit, and probably it is because they were excluded at that time. Uh, and it was very hard to understand, but they were excluded. Of course, in all of those cases, we have uh, concerns about what is happening in terms of the rule of law, but it was not uh, easy to understand why Bolivia, Guatemala, and El Salvador, for example, were excluded. So that, that is something that is not clear. Um, when do you apply the standards of democracy and when you mm -hmm. don't apply them? Inconsistency is also found in the way, for example, the United States is dealing with it as well. Mm -hmm. And the messages we are receiving uh, the last days is that, you know, uh, probably we will be able to coexist with Maduro forever. So that, that is another uh, concerning uh, example. Uh, and also, you don't, you no longer have um, consensus within the United States uh, about democracy. And that is something that changed dramatically as compared with the past. So you have the Republican Party uh, promoting some reforms which debilitate democracy very expensively. And then I think that is another, another issue that is affecting uh, the environment and the situation of the summit. Now, going to your questions, I, I would say that we have challenges both at the regional level and the domestic levels in terms of which kind of instruments we can use to respond to the challenges of uh, democracy or democratic governance. But let me first refer to the domestic challenges. Um, beyond the challenge of delivery, which was very well presented by the helm, I mean, if our governments are not able to respond to citizen needs, 
it's going to be very hard to ask them to believe in, in, in the world. <clears throat> and I am afraid that the situation will get even worse because we uh, are suffering uh, the uh, dramatic impact uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are many overlapping crises. The governments do not have the instruments to respond to the uh, citizens' demand. So what will happen is that uh, those demands will continue increasing, people will become more international, and the governments will not be able to respond. So although we are in the middle of an electoral cycle, and that basically means that people, you know, they have a kind of renewed hopes about what is going to happen, I don't think any going to change very well. So, uh, but beyond this kind of challenge, the challenge of delivering, uh, I think we have a challenge of representation and also a challenge of reforming uh, democratic government, governance in the right way. Concerning the challenge of representation, just let me give you some of the data that probably you already uh, have it. Uh, both political parties and parliaments, the most emblematic institutions of uh, representative democracies, are the less trusted institutions in the region. 30% as an average uh, in Latin America for, in the case of the political parties, and 20% in the case of Congress. And that means that uh, there is a lack of uh, trusted uh, collective um, vehicles or mechanisms to aggregate interest mm -hmm. and reach broad agreements. So that is a challenge for democratic governments. Um, and, and the other thing is how to reform democracy. When, 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 when we look at what is happening in terms of responses to these challenges we have, we found two kinds of responses. One is uh, more hyper residentialism. Okay, if democracy is not able to respond, so let's concentrate even more power in the president. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, the medicine will be worse than the disease. Okay, because we already know what is happening. Once that they access to power, those um, you know unscrupulous um, uh, populist autocrats. Uh, they they their power. They uh, they uh, only do you know negative things in that direction. And the other response, uh, which is very well intentioned, but at the end uh, it is not resolving the situation, but also it is aggravating the situation of democratic governance. Is fragmentation. Uh, you know, in the name of more participation. We are seeing electoral and political reforms in the region, uh, which basically are fragmenting uh, the political scenario. So it is that, that is the case, for example, of uh, Peru, is the case of uh, Colombia, where they found some ways to aggregate those uh, different political parties through the uh, conventions, the, uh, this, this, this uh, new mechanism. Also Costa Rica, for example. So I think that we have the challenges of the reforms. I understand you will later discuss these issues. And, and finally, we have the, the challenge of the regional instruments, of course. But as Kevin said, those mechanisms were designed uh, to respond uh, to other kinds of, uh, of disruption of democracies, or the coup d'etat. Uh, but no, they are no, 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 no design uh, to respond to this uh, slow process of democratic deterioration. It is probably true that we do not wake up in the region every day with more, um, with more um, autocrats or with more, um, um, you know, uh, dictatorships. But we wake up every day with less quality of democracy in the region. And the organization of American states is not being able to respond to those challenges. Many thanks. Thomas, I, I want to turn to you for a global question related to instruments that exist in other regions that have similarly committed themselves to, to democracy. I can echo loss, we can 
return to the European Union. What we've heard now, both from Nauda and, and from Kevin, is that the system designed to protect democracy in the Americas was not designed to protect against the current threat, which is this what's been described as a much slower deterioration in, in the quality of democratic institutions. I have to imagine that that same threat is visible elsewhere, though very unfortunately, we do have traditional military coup d'etat as well, um, undermining democracy in West Africa, um, in, in Myanmar and elsewhere. Could you talk a bit about whether other regions have developed more appropriate, more effective tools to fight this more modern threat? Thank you very much. And as I join my uh, panelists, my colleagues here, uh, I also want to thank the organizers uh, for bringing this all together on this important issue. Uh, the, let me just mention, uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Community of Democracies, that it was founded in the year 2000. And it was 107 nations that gathered and uh, looked at democracy. And of course, as Kevin has mentioned and others have mentioned, it was a very different time. Uh, Madeleine Albright was one of the founders of the community of democracies. And she has said to me, it was like rolling boulders down a hill. <laughs> she said, we felt like children in a candy shop in some ways because in the year 2000, we were thinking uh, democracy was the trajectory if one country was not a democracy, it was on a trajectory eventually to find its way. Uh, but the important thing that came of that meeting uh, was the Warsaw Declaration, which are 19 principles of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And the Warsaw Declaration focused very much on the individual and the inalienable rights of the individual. And so 22 years later, as we've reviewed that with younger generations, as we've looked at that in light of uh, challenges to democracy, which as they've mentioned, used to be primarily external. And today, many of the challenges, especially in our hemisphere, are internal. But we find that these principles still have relevance. And so uh, it was a year or so after the Warsaw Declaration that we saw the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And I think for both of those, what I would probably really recommend is this idea that we look at those afresh 20 years later, two decades or more later, we look at them afresh, not as catalogs of democratic standards, not as a regional gathering that issued a declaration. But we look at those, it would be the wrong word to say to weaponize those. Uh, that wouldn't be the right word speaking with democracy, but we look at those afresh with civil society as to how do we make those actionable? How do we make those accountable today? And so we are trying to do that uh, in a process in the community of democracies in which we look at, we, we ask member states to renew their membership through a reevaluation over time of their adherence to these civil society, human rights, rule of law standards. And we do that not only among our member states, we do that also with the active involvement of civil society. Kevin and I were yesterday with a group of uh, civil society organizations from across the region, and they were uh, solutions oriented. I, I think it was a very good group and I was very happy to be a part of that. Looking at the rule, you know, governments are only going to move so far. I, we have found that uh, uh, as they look at who's invited to a summit, there are other issues involved than who's simply a good democratic partner. There are important issues involved with Venezuela that didn't exist just a year or so ago uh, as we look at global issues. And so uh, what I found is that we've got to really enhance that role of civil society because they're the ones who are holding government's feet to the fire. Governments see only those ultimate big objectives. Uh, civil society sees the person. And so those are uh, some of the ideas I would have towards <coughs> solutions. But it is really going to be, again, uh, people in the streets, uh, movements of people that are going to make these things happen rather than governments themselves, because governments are always going to move along. Uh, in a somewhat compromised fashion. Many thanks. Speaking of the, the importance of civil society, I wanna bring Mari Clara Costa into this conversation, um, not only because of the, the role that you and your organization play, but also because of the case of Mexico itself, 
as arguably an example of the kinds of processes that we're seeing that are very difficult to address given the time scale of the, of the democratic decline. I don't want to exaggerate the conditions in Mexico, and so I'll let you describe the concerns that you've expressed and what you work on every day <clears throat> and what lessons that might offer for how Latin America itself, these multilateral institutions, the United States, can be more effective as guardians of democratic institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and, and for um, this very challenging and interesting panel. Um, I think that one of the problems of Mexico, one of the many, many problems of Mexico is that there's been a lot of attention put on um, democratic elections and getting the means to achieve political office. And very, very little has been done in terms of governance. And that is the problem that eventually has led to this regression that we're experiencing in Mexico, which is serious. I, I, perhaps it doesn't look as serious as other parts of the region, but it is. Um, and um, we just had uh, elections this last weekend. Um, at this point, it, <laughs> Every comment that I have read about the election so far, it, what the comments say is that these elections were won by a movement, but basically by an individual. And that individual is President Manuel López Um The political parties are losing whatever they had. They're very, very weak and, and um, and Morena is this very strange mix of, of, of members of the PRI, of the PAN, of the PRD, and you know, other leaders. Uh, but basically, it is a movement run by the president who devotes three hours a day to talking at length to the people of Mexico. And, and, and so what we are seeing is the sort of the dissolution of, of institutions of those. I mean, I think the one that is in, in, in greatest danger is, of course, the National Board for Elections, INE, uh, which is going to be attacked. I mean, there's, there is already an electoral reform in the making uh, and to, 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 to rip it of its autonomy, its independence, and of course, its budget. And it's a very um, paradoxical situation because if there is one institution that has the trust of the, of the citizens of Mexico is precisely the electoral board. Mm -hmm. But it is, and, and, it's, and its performance in these last elections was extraordinary. Uh, and to say nothing of, of, of the elections uh, the midterm elections last year where we had 20,000 uh, contact, I mean, the offices that were up for election. So, and Ina did a wonderful job, but it is, it is very much on the line for uh, a, a, a serious reform. And who knows what will happen, but, uh, but it is one of Lopez Obrador's next goals is to dismantle the Ina and make it more manageable centralized power, political power, um, and, and, and of course, have an influence on who is, I mean, I don't see Lopez Obrador staying in power, you know, um, forever um, in, in the way that Chavez did or other leaders, but, but he certainly is going to try and affect <coughs> who will succeed him. And for that, we need to refashion the electoral system. Having said that, I think that the big, big issue of Mexico, and it always has been an issue, and this is why people are so, uh, I would say, dissatisfied with, <coughs> with political parties. And it's because um, extreme corruption, total lack of accountability. I mean, we have, we have a justice system uh, that is incapable of investigating more than 95% of the crimes that exist in this country. And this has been going on for decades. That's a huge issue. 
And that issue, of course, has to do directly with the very, very serious condition of public security. Public security in Mexico is a disaster. We've had more home and it grows. The disaster grows and grows and grows. We have more victims of homicide than we have had uh, in previous governments. And this is serious. We have appalling figures <laughs> of disappearances. I mean, the latest count was 100,000 disappeared people. And, and, and this is most of them come from the year 2006. Um, and we can go on and on and on. And then there is another issue, which is civic space. Civic space is closing, 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 closing. We are the most dangerous country for journalists uh, in the world, the most dangerous country for journalists that are not in a conflict situation. Um, we've just had 11 assassinated journalists this year alone. Again, an impunity rate of 99%. Um, human rights defenders, 97 human rights defenders have been murdered uh, since the year 2018, adding to a list. Uh, most of these, by the way, are environmentalists. Um, again, total impunity. And every day, the president of Mexico rails against the press, the independent press. They actually have a section in his daily program to point out the lies of the press. Uh, and so, and again, um, attacks on civil society organizations. So when we talk about the role of civil society, it's, it's as if we had a given that social that civil society is going to be able to perform and act when there are very the conditions for civil society to mobilize are closing down, closing down, closing down. So what I would say is that we have a serious problem of accountability, um, a serious problem of, of state delivery of goods. The COVID uh, pandemic was a case in point, and a growing uh, inequality and, and, and poverty. I mean, there are more poor people in Mexico now, 3.8 million, according to the latest estimates, than there were before Lopez Obrador came to power. So what is that? But, but at the same time, he is the most popular president. Uh, he has a, about a 60% of popularity. So what is happening? <laughs> you know? And I think, well, there are a lot of, of, of handouts, of cash handouts that are very important. Social programs are absolutely, I think, one of the reasons why this type of government uh, can have such a high rate of popularity and be able to mobilize. And the narrative. The narrative is absolutely essential, and it, 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 and it is perfect. So I would end with that. Yes, sure. I, I want to ask a question, but, but feel free yeah, yeah. To, to react as sure. well. But the, the question I have for you is, so we've heard many times, starting with our, our excellent introductory remarks about the lower quality of public goods, the necessity of marrying democracy yeah. to, to the performance of government. My question for you, Kevin, is whether that takes us in a, in a direction where democracy advocates like you will be asked instead to be advocates for better public security, advocates for economic growth, advocates for the kinds of policies that, that we now think of as making democracy deliver, and not advocates for democratic institutions, for democratic yeah. life. Yeah. Oh, well, look, I mean, this is, I'll answer your question, and then I'm going to say something else uh, that came up in the, in the course of the the conversation, that many interesting things have come up in the course of the conversation. Um, to your question, I mean, I think that if we've learned something over the past two years of the pandemic is that the quality of democratic governance literally saves lives, mm -hmm. right? So I would hope that we would really make a collective, we will really make a collective effort to put 
discussions about the quality of democratic governance at the heart of public debates. And that means engaging in a serious conversation uh, about issues, for example, of institutional design. How do we revisit some of the features of our political systems that are hampering the ability to make decisions and to solve problems in, a, in an effective and efficacious way? And I'll give you one, you know, for whatever reason, and there are many, and some of them were mentioned by, by, by President Chichilla, Laura. Uh, we've accepted, I mean, we've, we've sort of uh, gotten used to this uneasy coexistence between presidential systems and fragmented party systems. Mm -hmm. And we seem to think, for whatever reason, that it's part of our lot to be presidential system forever and ever. <laughs> it, it, and I, it beats me. I mean, I don't know why is that. I mean, I, I get it. You know, there are historical traditions and so on. But it is so blatantly obvious that this is creating problems all over the place that I would think that we would do well to revisit that discussion. Number one. Number two, by way of you know, uh, an issue that matters for the quality of democratic uh, in governance, fiscal pacts, the issue of fiscal robustness. It is impossible to provide exactly what Helmut was saying, I mean, to provide public goods and services in an adequate way if you don't have the fiscal firepower to do that. And that means revisiting our tax systems, but also the way in which we spend. Uh, so the question of fiscal robustness, and that I think requires in most countries uh, some kind of fiscal pact. Number three, the issue of the quality of public administration, public management, which used to be seen you know, as this you know, issue in the periphery of the democratic debate, you know, as a kind of technical issue. It's not. I mean, the, the, the ability of states to provide public goods and services hinges upon that, upon the quality of uh, bureaucratic structures, upon the quality of public managers, and so on and so forth. Number four, the issue of trust which we've seen that is an essential issue for the ability of governments to respond in times of crisis. And it is impossible to talk about the question of trust in Latin America without talking about the question of corruption, which is having a toxic effect all over the place. So getting serious about reducing, eliminating, hopefully, impunity for corruption is a must if trust is to be built. So there you have the makings of, I mean, there might be other issues, but there you have the, the basic contours of a robust agenda on the quality of democratic governance that I would hope would be at the center of public debate. Uh, and I'll save my other comment for, 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 for later, which is on the question of, you know, and I'll try to be, if you ask me about it, or if given the opportunity okay, on the question of how to activate, a, how to solve the, the, the fiendishly difficult issue of correcting the, the unenforceability of the current mechanisms that we have to protect democracy in the region. Well, I'll, I'll save that for sure. No, no, we will get to it, it's critical. Laura, I wanna ask you the, the same question I asked Kevin, which is, should we as defenders of democracy be talking about the quality of elections, the independence of judiciaries, um, or should we be talking about how governments deliver? It should the whole conversation at this point be about pro proper administration, proper management, of bureaucratic institutions? Should it be about the notion that you cannot defend democracy unless you have governments that can satisfy the basic needs of the population? Are we discussing this in the wrong framing entirely is, is my question. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, I think it is impossible to, uh, to think about uh, sustained uh, democracy if you don't have a robust uh, system of people of law, for example. 
It's impossible. But it is also impossible to imagine because we, we, everybody's saying, look, but on the positive side, democracy has been resilient in Latin America. But we, 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 we shouldn't aspire uh, for democracy to be resilient. We want democracy to transcend. Otherwise, it would be impossible to sustain the process in the region. And, 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 and in doing that, we have to go beyond the, the electoral uh, system challenges, which I think, in general terms, we are doing quite well in that sense. The, the problem is not there. And Marie Claire put it very clear. The problem is not necessarily elections, how we are organizing elections, how professional the electoral bodies are. The problem is this. And let me let me give you let me give you some uh, information which is very interesting. I think that the people, the people are demanding, and that has to do with what Thomas mentioned about the importance of civil society. Uh, for me, it's the most important pillar right now. If we want to do something. Uh, about democracy in the future. If we do not come civil society, we won't be able to go through. But this is what people are doing. Uh, because we have to recognize that people of citizens are turning out to vote. You know, we, democracy is in crisis, but people turn out to vote. Now we are in the middle of the uh, 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 electoral cycle and we, we, we can see what is happening. But also, 70 77%, almost 80% of people consider voting a good thing. When that percentage is disaggregated, 40%, 46% consider that one should always vote. And more than 30% consider that one should vote always, but also protest. That means that people have discovered that there is political life between one election and the other. Mm -hmm. They are demanding participation. And that has to do most with the youth. So the, the, the true challenge we have in our region is, in one hand, to renew and rewire the more traditional channels of um, democratic uh, representation, what to do about Congress, uh, the parliaments, uh, political parties, there is important reforms uh, there. And Kevin um, talked about uh, the challenges of the presidentialist, the, the presidential system. And on the other hand, we need to design and put forward mechanisms for citizen participation. Every time that I have mentioned this issue, in the last five to six years, the reaction on the political side and the academic side is very concerned. They tell me, be careful, be careful. Well, look, the populists are doing that. They are using the people. They are mobilizing the people. They are convening the people through referendums with no legitimacy. So we must be able to channelize that demand coming from the people about more participation. And one, one, one last comment because uh, very recently, I participated in, a, in a, a new report uh, on human security, which just basically tried to revisit the concept of human security. And when it came to Latin America, we decided to put forward a new concept, and that is criminal governance. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a huge challenge we are having here. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of uh, comments of abrazo no balazo, that kind of negotiations in El Salvador, uh, what it means is that you already have uh, the gangs um, working as political actors. And you need to be very realistic about what we are going to do. And that has to do also with United States foreign policy and the recognition that the uh, drug policy in the hemisphere has been a collective failure. Mm -hmm. If we do, don't, don't do anything there, we will, it will be possible to. Uh, to those other challenges to Thomas, let, let's dig deeper into the question of, of public opinion with regards to democracy beyond leading civil society organizations, but the, the, the larger groups of people living in these societies. 
you know, we hear generally about cynicism about democracy. We see data in the Americas from Latino Barometro and others showing a, a significant decline in, in support for democratic institutions and greater indifference, not a support for authoritarian systems, but an indifference um, that's, I think, a, a result of real desperation for, for better government performance. Yet we hear some positive data here as well of, of reasonable levels of participation in elections and even in between elections, the idea of remaining engaged. Can you talk about the, the importance of engaging broader publics in this discussion about the quality and sustainability of democracy? Well, very similar to uh, the numbers that presented Chin Shio just mentioned, uh, the community of democracies uh, late last year did a 55 nation survey along with uh, think tanks from Argentina, Brazil, Japan, uh, Germany, and the United States. And we found also great dissatisfaction with the performance of democracy. But we also found a uh, number similar to what the president just mentioned. And that was people still believing protest and voting were, were what they wanted and what they were looking to do. And so uh, you did find that as you separated it out, specific groups of the populations, of course, feeling alienated in particular. And this is why I think we have to really focus on young people uh, I've worked in the field of democracy promotion for a few decades, and I know that once upon a time, uh, back in the good old days, as we might say, uh, you went out and you worked on getting young people engaged in the system, and you knew you were going to be getting a strong democratic uh, outcome. And that's not necessarily true today. Young people are being uh, hit through social media on all types of ideas for policy and governance. Uh, you have to be a little bit more discerning today, but still they are the key, I believe. Uh, a greater engagement of women, participation of women uh, in the political system. You look at our democracy, see we still find that uh, at this current rate they're going, it will be 50 to 100 years before you start to see gender equality in elected office, unless something is done to really jumpstart that. So, uh, the idea of moving, I think, into inclusion, participation of uh, previously marginalized groups is one of the key answers, I think, for democracies in, in trying to move forward and trying to address these issues. I did just want to say briefly about the idea of uh, democracy that doesn't deliver or democracies that aren't seen as delivering. I, I think we're in a special period right now in which we could look at these ideas, for instance, Kevin said about looking at uh, institutional design, because we are facing, I think due to the pandemic, uh, but also facing due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we're seeing that suddenly food being weaponized in a way it never was before. We saw through the pandemic supply chain issues in which we realize democracies can't trust uh, authoritarian nations to deliver essential items. Uh, and so we need to, uh, I think, take all of these things into account, but realize now is an inflection point at which we can do this. Uh, we can talk about how challenging the pro problems are from the last decade, but I think we're at an inflection point where we can look at something new. We'll always need a universal membership body, such as the United Nations, or even a summit that includes all nations in the region but there is still a way for democracies to work together to approach that. Let me briefly ask, let me clear you one more question and then we have about uh, 15 minutes left and then President Boric of Chile will be here uh, to speak to us as well. Um, and, and so just if, if you have questions as well for our experts, please think of them now and there should be a microphone that will circulate. My question for you is about this, this challenge of the unpredictability of engaging with the broader public that we've heard. Um, it, Mexico, as you've pointed out, is a case of a president you've described as, as weakening democratic institutions would be extremely popular. El Salvador is another classic example of this. It appears to be a challenge for defenders of democracy when democratically elected, very popular leaders are engaging in practices that seem to be setting the country in an authoritarian direction. How do you challenge that both for externally and, and as advocates within the country? Um, how do you challenge that? I think one way of, of challenging it is, is, is going to the areas where the lack of accountability of that government is, has, is more acute and has a terrible, terrible consequences. 
And that has to do with human rights, obviously. And it has to do with the right to life and the right to, to, to liberty, but mostly the right to life, which is a big, big issue in Mexico right now. Um, and I think, for instance, the mobilization of women's groups has been extremely important in Mexico because of the fact that, uh, well, something like 10 women are being assassinated in Mexico every day. Uh, so the, the, the violence, and this was particularly acute during the pandemic. Uh, but there's one thing, I mean, one thing is to mobilize and protest, and the other thing is to achieve results. And Mexico has always had, had mobilizations and protests. Uh, but never results. And so I think that that is the greatest challenge of all. Um, and I can, I mean, I can give examples of that. Uh, I think perhaps a very uh, relevant example having to do with the right to life is the whole issue of disappearances in Mexico. People, uh, the state has done practically nothing to investigate disappearances, although with this government, there's some, been some progress. Uh, but it's mostly the, the, the families themselves who go out in the field uh, to dig for remains and try and find out what happened to their loved ones. And I mean, this is a phenomenon of thousands and thousands of people. And yet the results are almost negligent. Uh, so if you have to go to that particular uh, aspect of the whole issue of, of participation. And that has to do with the rule of law, uh, which President Chi Chi gets a very clear and, <laughs> and it's 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 I think there where we have to focus a great deal of effort. So go ahead, Kevin, and then Jenny, I wanted to see if you had any insights and others. I know it's other expertise in the room. Go please go. Thank you. I mean, on this question of what to do mm -hmm. in, you know, when faced with the Bukele's, the Lopez Obradores of, of, this, of this world, uh, I, you mentioned, Ben, almost in passing, something that I think is key in this story, which is the notion of indifference. Uh, I mean, part of what's happening, uh, particularly in, in, in this case, is like, Salvador or Mexico is that simply people are not ready to give up on democracy. Uh, you know, they, to Tom's uh, points, people are happy to support democracy in theory, but are deeply unhappy with democracy in practice. Uh, and what we're seeing in Latin America is very little according to the evidence, very little in the way of increased support for authoritarian options, a straight up authoritarian options, very little. What's going up is the proportion of people that say that for them, it will be exactly the same to have a democratic system or an authoritarian system. That's the problem. So that tells you that the, the real danger to democracy, and here I go to one of the points raised by, by Laura, the real danger to democracy in Latin America is not really about military takeovers or sudden reverse, reversals of democracy. It's about the gradual degradation in the quality of democracy. And, and here, you know, I, I go to the point that I made early, earlier about the, the quality of democratic governance. Look, I mean, we can, we can make the, case, the normative case for democracy until we go blue in the face. For 98% of the people out there, the proof of the pie is in the eater. It's about democracy being able to solve real problems for real people. And it so happens that when you look at the figures in Latin America, to me, the, the single most important figure to explain what's happening with democracy in Latin America and to explain this enormous disaffection that we're seeing is this piece of data that comes in a Latino Aroma. The 77% of the population in Latin America that are convinced 
that the government works to further the interest of the powerful few instead of the interest of the people as a whole. Mm -hmm. How do you build democratic legitimacy in such a situation? I mean, how do you build democratic legitimacy in a situation in which almost 80% of the people are convinced that the system works for the enchufados? Very difficult. Excellent. Uh, we, we will just be joined in just a moment by President Gabriel Buric of Chile. So please join me in thanking our excellent panelists here.